of stuff. So I don't know. We'll see what comes. Um, and, the, and the fourth person on the panel is Hannah Joyce Hoven, who is the um, artist liaison at the Playwright Center in Minneapolis. So she can talk a little bit about you know, writers and resources and whatever. And I, we are streaming on HowlRound. We are entertaining questions at hashtag InchFest. So <coughs> How is everything, uh, Annabelle? Are you putting in people's bios or just their names? Okay, good. Hello, Hi, how are you? How are you? Good, thanks. Good. I'm just going to uh, hit the John. Be right back. Somebody's bringing John up. Oh, I'm sure. I think we should introduce ourselves because I think we best know why we're in this room. Okay, so I George, even though I appreciate you dearly, I will just get it where you want to start it. I probably will start. 
hard to hear the screen. I'll just get my camera. Yeah, I'm going to make it easy on you this time around. I, I will tell you then. How's your audio? Um, how's your audio, Annabelle? Check one, two, check one, two, check, 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 check. We are live streaming from the HFest. This is my favorite part of the whole thing is that we're on the web this year. Right? Do I look okay? I didn't do anything about my... Good. Good morning, everyone. Just a minute, please. Okay. Well, that's a New York's turned into a clearinghouse. It's not necessarily your stuff. Even though I'm on Just board a minute. Just a minute.
we trying to end a little early? Or is your part here and you're just going to jump with Donald Tay's workshop? She's at the time. She's introducing her. Almost based in Chicago. I'm excited. With that? That's OK. I think that's perfect. I was going to take him, but she's introducing him. So. I'm just really nervous that he's here. Did you crack that? I think I, I did. I cracked it. You cracked it. Hi. Hi, Hi, Hannah. Yeah, yes. Hello. Hi. You're going to sit somewhere. I'll sit next to you. Yeah, oh. Jeffrey, Hannah, nice to see you again. Yep. Oh, it's pouring rain. It's pouring rain. And you got the earlier shuttle, Jeff, I guess. I got the lift from Jackson Briar. I was hoping to oh. swing by. By the way, you are going to be in the Landon house again. To see if you can find my jacket. Okay. Oh. <laughs> it's, I guess he left be his somewhere. jacket behind. I guess it will be the jacket. And somehow I'll get to the land of Judy's going to take you. Judy. Hi, Judy. Hello. This is Donald Margulies, our Donald honorary. Margulies. And there are these lovely three or four people who are here. Yes, we're going to make them. Should, we, uh, should I sit at the end? You sit at the end. Okay, all right. There's some water if you need it. We're already audio. Oh, what's this? Uh, oh, Mario. Mario. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's this? And oh, what uh, audio? My the audio is already live. No. Oh, okay. Oh, I'll stop pressing. And we should each introduce ourselves because that will relieve you. Okay, your question. Oh, please. <laughs> I, well, I can. Thank I you, can. Yes, I can. Hello, Hannah. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? I've been joking with you later. I'm sorry? You're doing your <laughs> piece. <laughs> two yeah, <laughs> two o'clock, yeah. <laughs> and where's that going to be? The black box. Basically. Wherever Basically. that is. Mm -hmm. in, this, yeah. in, the in the fine arts building. Okay. Yeah. We'll show the, you. The, one, show the, you. The, the one where the drive circles up to, right? It's where, where all the books are, are piled. Where all of your books are piled. Well, not all, all of my of books, books are piled. Are they're right. they're no, flying out. No, I got the one that I, I mean, I could have. Could You're have in Minneapolis. Yeah, well, I my, the, the anthology of my How's plays, that? but nobody's going to buy the Yeah? Yeah, yeah, I love it. It's, it's too expensive. My son is at Jim I bought it. Oh, I should have brought it. You're the one. I should have got accepted to McAllister. I'm waiting for him to release it. But I think he's going to go to the Did, but I think he's going to go to the Wesleyan. Right now, what they're doing is they're going to Barnes and Noble. Wesleyan is cool. Really hard to get into. They're down off the shelf. They're drinking coffee, spilling coffee on the shelf. Oh, no. Actually, he got waitlisted for it. It's a $60 book. I wouldn't buy that. Yeah, I bought it when you um, hey, talked to Brown the public library with Lynn and Brown. I don't think he. He doesn't want to go to McAllister. I bought it that day. Really? really? Oh, I don't know that much about it. It's a wonderful school. It's a wonderful school. It's but it's. He's creative. Yeah. I keep agitating for an evil version to be released because. Of course. Okay. My son's had a great time at McAllister. It's too heavy. Okay. He's graduating next month. Annabelle, are you good? To close the doors. Oh well. Judy, uh, would you close the doors? Thank you. There's three people there. I know. But there's who knows how many people out there. Yeah. Well, Ooh, at the very least, we fun. can have fun. What's that? We can take I said that. at the very least, we can have we, fun. Yes, we will have fun talking to each other. Yeah. This, is, this is for certain. Thanks, Judy. No worries. Annabelle, are you good? Okay. Annabelle, are you the technician? Yes, Annabelle Howard, thank you very much for helping us with live stream. And are you an interested party? I'm an interested party, yes. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. And Candice <laughs> Chappelle, ladies and gentlemen. It's also interesting. Well, are, are, are we officially launched? We are, we are officially launched. Well, thank you to HowlRound TV for having us uh, here from the Inch Festival. All right. And I'm, I'm Jeff Sweet. I, I seem to be uh, at least technically moderating this. I'm a, I'm a playwright and uh, theater historian and such. And I'm Karen Carpenter, and I'm acting as the interim artistic director currently. I'm also on the Inge Festival Foundation Board, but it is my pleasure to be here uh, this year and to get to honor uh, a playwright that uh, is profound to me and also extremely entertaining, uh, deep, 
and I had a lot of fun. Donald Margulies. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm that person. <laughs> uh, Thank you. <laughs> Maria? I'm Maria Mazur. I'm a freelance theater director. I have the delight of being a director in the festival, directing a reading of Donald Margulies' play, The Country House. And I'm Hannah Joyce Hoven. I am I'm the membership manager at the Playwright Center. In Minneapolis. In Minneapolis, yes. Right. So I, I guess the uh, topic uh, under, con under consideration here is uh, it's a development to, uh, to production, to premiere or whatever, and, and the various different uh, uh, problems that we face. And we were chatting uh, a little bit beforehand about uh, there seems to be this, still this dynamic where um, theaters are generally interested, if they are interested, in doing premieres, but they're not terribly interested in doing second productions of plays unless they've been validated in New York. Mm -hmm. So we've got this uh, situation in which um, if you have a production in a regional theater, a premiere in a regional theater, if it mm -hmm. doesn't from there go to New York and get validated by the national press, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to get uh, uh, it out into uh, uh, the general repertoire. And uh, does anybody want to uh, either I endorse, amplify, refute, or uh, tap dance around this subject? <laughs> Let's tap dance. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm very good at tap dancing. Uh, uh, I, I think that's largely true, mm -hmm. but there are always exceptions. You know, give, give us some exceptions. Well, you know, something like uh, Almost Maine, yeah. which is a play that did not get uh, wildly reviewed in New York modestly reviewed, modestly produced, and it is the most produced play in the country. And mm -hmm. it has been the most, and by, I mean hundreds of productions a year. Yeah. I know this because I'm on the board at Dramatis Place of Those. Uh, full disclosure. Full disclosure. Yeah. Um, so that is, that is a phenomenon. Yeah. I can't explain why these things happen. I don't know why a play that, that uh, had modest, uh, a modest reception mm -hmm would have attracted this kind of viral uh, uh, approval. I, I, I don't understand it. Good for him, good, good for John Cariani. I think all playwrights would love to have that kind of acceptance, but I don't really understand how something of that scale happens without the imprimatur of the New York Times. I think it's a situation where it meets the production needs of a lot of companies, and that's well, probably it. Well, it does, but a lot of plays do yeah. that don't get that kind of life. So how does something catch fire? How do you think that caught fire? Because uh, Mari and I were talking the other day about, she and I have both been stuck in this boat where we've worked very hard with a writer on a play and we've done a developmental production of some sort, mm -hmm. uh, some kind of sort of a staged workshop or what have you, and something is written about it and once something is written about it, no one else will touch it because they won't get the press for it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. is it the press that kind of Helps those things continue, like Almost Maine, do you think? I mean, I'm. I don't know how much the press had to do with Almost Maine. I would have a hunch that one of the things that might have to do with that is that the, there are a lot of self contained scenes which probably get done in a lot of acting classes and workshops. Sure. And just as uh, the Fantastics got started because a producer saw a scene from it in an acting workshop, that sometimes acting classes and workshops become. Uh, you know, the seeds of people, mm -hmm. oh, have you seen this, have you heard that, and, and, and that's mm -hmm. a way of something getting around. Right. I think we underestimate the degree to which uh, getting stuff done a lot in acting workshops across the country uh, pollinates. Uh, uh, no question. And, yeah. and, and those scenes lend themselves to, uh, yeah. to, to precisely that. But that, that seems to be uh, very yeah. much, you, you mentioned that as one of the few exceptions. Yes, uh, that I'm aware of. Yeah. yeah. And, and, there's also, you used the word viral. Yeah. Um, I think something that's quite interesting that's happening today is that anybody can review anything. Mm -hmm. um, most, uh, many theaters, right. have, especially smaller theaters, have websites where they let their patrons just, you know, comment on every show. Mm. They might curate it a little bit. But, um, <laughs> you know, there's a, a pro and a con to that. But one of the pros of it is that sometimes something can really catch fire with audiences that isn't necessarily catching fire with critics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we're also faced with, I think, the, uh, the problem of um, there are very few critics with any uh, national credibility or muscle anymore because the newspapers are cutting back on, uh, on arts coverage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Donald and I had the good fortune of encountering uh, a, a critic in Chicago who I think was one of the, the last people who had that kind of muscle. Richard Christensen. Richard Christensen, mm -hmm. who more than any other single person was responsible for the Chicago theater boom. Um, and Chris Jones, to some degree, is, mm -hmm. is, is, is still doing that. But yes. I, I can't think of who in Philadelphia is doing that. I can't think of who in, uh, in most other cities has got that kind of energy, credibility, or commitment. I mean, I know in San Diego, when I was running the Old Globe for Jack, I, I, um, they shuttered the theater criticism. And essentially, I actually think it was a, a woman who was reviewing dance was covering theater mm -hmm. suddenly. And I remember having a conversation with her in which she felt she was sort of ill-equipped to mm. have any kind of rigorous comment about what she'd seen. Um, mm. Well, uh, the, the, uh -huh. part of yeah. it's an economic thing because mm -hmm. they, the newspapers yeah. don't make much money out of theater advertising and they don't think that many of their audience, much of their audience goes to see it, so why should they spend the resources mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, which is, I think, so short-sighted because the, um, the identity of a town is so frequently fixed by uh, mm -hmm. theatrical representations of the mm -hmm. town, and those plays go out and become ambassadors uh, for a town. Mm -hmm. I have to sort of take my hat off to somebody who is doing very hard work. I don't always agree with him by any means, uh, and that's uh, the, the, the Terry Teach out at the Wall Street Journal, who has maintained a ridiculous uh, schedule running around the country, seeing. Mm -hmm stuff in small theaters all over the country. The fact that I don't always agree with him is, uh, 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 nonetheless, he's doing, uh, mm -hmm. he's doing work that very few other people have uh, the energy or the emotional commitment to do, and it is working very conscientiously to see shows in mm -hmm. small theaters. When he shows up at the Writers Theater, which was a 100-seat theater right? in the yes. suburb of Chicago, and, and mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's kind of important. I don't know very many, many other people doing it. Mm -hmm. And alas, these people are the people who give our plays frequently their second chance. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, mean mm -hmm. I think one, one reason I wanted to slate this panel is, is to address the issue that I was confronting when I was programming for the Old Globe that I have no doubt every producer faces, which is that we've weaned our audience on a diet of premieres. They yeah. expect your season to be loaded with premieres or stars. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we've done that. Like, like, mm -hmm. like, like, that has happened. We've met the culture in that way, and or we've maybe even created the culture to to mm -hmm. fall in that direction. And um, and it's and that is one of the biggest problems, I think, to me, because mm -hmm. you you are someone who's had premieres and and were not satisfied by the by the. I mean, not not to cast aspersions on it, but it didn't somehow deliver in the way that you wanted. And, and the place needed more exploration, more. Well, but that was always my intention. Mm -hmm, having, mm -hmm. having a premiere outside of the glare of New York mm -hmm. used to be uh, a way to develop a play. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, there, you, there, you're not safe anywhere mm -hmm. uh, because of the pervasiveness of the internet, for one, and also because of, you know, the New York Times uh, will go anywhere to see a new play. Well, certainly of mine, and you know, and and it's a it's a mixed blessing. Yeah, if, if once you have a certain profile, they'll hunt you down wherever you are. Yeah. So, I, you know, so the reason that I would premiere something at South Coast Rep or at the Geffen Playhouse would be with the foreknowledge that I'm going to be developing this play. This gives me a first opportunity mm -hmm. to see it with an audience and to develop it with a director who I, for most most instances, will take it to New York. Mm -hmm. And it's part of my process, but what happens mm -hmm. now is that the process is under scrutiny instead of it being a final product. Mm -hmm. Now the critics are, for better and for worse, are, in, are invite themselves in uh, perhaps prematurely. Mm -hmm. What's, what is your experience like in, in Minneapolis? I'm curious. It's, there's a, a blend, and, and it's really interesting to hear you all talking about this uh, because sometimes it's um, the development process for, for people is as far as they get, and sometimes they don't get further right. than, than that, I'm making relationships with producers, directors. And we're, we're trying to address both there, um, and sometimes it's bringing people out to see a work that's in development and meeting someone. Um, but I, I think this having a safe place, in a way, what you're talking about, having a safe place to develop, to workshop, to be the director of your own 
um, development workshop. And to not have to show it to anyone if you don't want to mm -hmm. is something that isn't happening everywhere and is um, really crucial mm -hmm. uh, in just, I'm not a playwright, but just from what I hear from playwrights who get that opportunity to just be with their play and have what they need in the moment and not have to um, present it before it's ready. Mm -hmm. But well, they, are, they aren't answerable. They aren't answerable to a given like no, this is right. always the way. But when they're ready, if if there are organizations or people out there who can help them take the next step to meeting the people who need to see their plays. I know. Mm -hmm. I know. Here we host two playwrights every semester at the Inch House uh, for eight or nine weeks or so, and it culminates in a developmental workshop. And we and and the history here has always been that something is presented at the end of that week. But I know we had one of the writers from the Playwright Center here this last semester, and she wanted to spend her time here researching a local history story about the, um, the Circle Mine in Oklahoma where the, the EPA has poisoned, and mm -hmm. um, so she really needed the time to research and do all mm -hmm. that legwork, and then she started to write, and I think we, uh, who, I wasn't here yet, but I think there was, we, there was an obligation felt by the Inn Center to present something of hers, right. mm -hmm. but I said to her, it doesn't have to be, it, it is mm -hmm. completely up to you how you use that time and those resources, mm -hmm. because it really is for you. Mm -hmm. it, we are a resource for you. you, you how, how was it dealt with ultimately? She, she did a few scenes, uh -huh. because she wanted to hear them, right. mm -hmm. and she had the actors, and she had the director that, you know, to help right. her deliver them, right. and because she wanted to get a read on how they were working. Mm -hmm. You know, but I know uh, s something about your process, having interviewed you a bit for this. Mm -hmm. um, that when you, you know, I, I, it's been told to me that when you write, you'll write some dialogue, and then you'll say, and so, something else happens here, and then you'll write another bit of dialogue or something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you need to have that. You need to have yeah. that space and that time to let it come to yeah. the page, I, right? I, I have profited enormously from readings of plays, mm -hmm. and Jeff would know because he was there literally at the beginning because we started out together for purposes of full disclosure. Jeffrey yeah. and I met 37 years ago. Was ah. it? Uh, 37 years ago. Oh, okay. And, uh, <laughs> when you were 12. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. but uh, what I do to this day is that when I'm working on a play, I will, at, and Candace Chappelle, who's in the audience today, yeah was present at the creation of collected stories. Um, and let me just give, let me just cite that as an example of, of my process, if, if you're curious. Um, I was, I had a commission from South Coast Repertory. My friend Jerry Patch was the dramaturg literary manager there, and I was va rather sluggish in my delivery of a play for South Coast. This was after the success of Sight Unseen. This is early to mid 90s now. And uh, Jerry, at that point, was running the Sundance Playwrights Institute. And he said, why don't you come to Sundance with the play that you have? I said, Jerry, I have like 15 pages. He said, bring the 15 pages. He said, who do you need? What, what kind of actors do you need? I said, I need two women. I need an older woman, younger woman. And I think it's going to be a two-hander. I wasn't even certain at that point. Hmm. So Candace Chappelle, one of the best unheralded actresses in America, uh, was available to me. Uh, I never met Candace. And she was there at the first reading of the 15 pages of the play that became Collected Stories at, in uh, Provo, Utah in 1995, four, something like that. And, uh, and what was so uh, galvanizing about hearing the play read by two committed actresses, Lisa Peterson was the director, she was there from that first day, mm -hmm. is that I was given the luxury of hearing what I had, getting feedback, and not even so much feedback, but hearing it for myself. Mm -hmm. And then I w went off to my little cabin, mm -hmm. <laughs> and eight days later, with interim uh, uh, rehearsals, mm -hmm. I had an hour and 45 minutes of collective Wow, story. that was fast. <laughs> it was one of the most mm -hmm. exhilarating writing periods of my life. Mm. I don't know that I'll ever replicate that. Mm -hmm. But it was thrilling to begin with 15 very rough motley pages. And then at the end of the festival, I had almost the entire play. Mm. And so you wrote a little, every, or, you know, some every day. Oh, I was on fire. 
Wow. It was thrill a thrilling time for me. It mm -hmm. really was. But I needed to. Was that the first kind of thing like that you'd done? I think it probably was the first mm -hmm. time that I, I mean, mm -hmm. I've, I've, <laughs> I am a poster boy for development in uh, mm -hmm. American regional theater. Because mm -hmm. uh, Sight Unseen began as something very different. Yeah. Uh, it, it was something called Heartbreaker. It too was a commission from South Coast, actually my first commission from South Coast. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it became sight unseen only after a very arduous and humiliating process of development yeah. where it became clear that the play wasn't very interesting. And uh, I put it aside, but there were two scenes in the play that were of particular interest. And I realized that the play was, was lurking in those scenes. Which scenes were they? They were scenes involving a character named Jonathan Waxman who was a struggling artist in the original version who, who visits his former... Uh, muse and college girlfriend mm -hmm. and those were clearly telling me this is the play schmuck so <laughs> well, I, I remember because, uh, yeah. because Donald and I were members of a group that we essentially created yeah. uh, called the writer's block and I remember we set aside a whole session to read heartbreakers and that we did we did Oh, wow. We set aside a whole session to read Heartbreakers. I remember Heartbreaker, it. Heartbreaker, singular. Sing, singular. Oh, oh, singular, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and that at the end of it, everybody, it was a, uh, always a combination of, of, of candor and kindness, which is a, a, a difficult. Perfect mix, actually. Mm -hmm. But but we basically said, this isn't, war, but that, that's, the scenes there are mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. really good. And um, I, we, we, those were the scenes that we pointed to. And it became glaringly obvious, actually, because we did a, a workshop at South Coast of Heartbreaker. Yeah. And um, did you read it publicly? Yes. Mm -hmm. It was rough. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it, did well, you know already? I did. I had already public? fallen out of love with it. I, I think uh, you, 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 uh, you once said that yeah. it was the only case that you know of where a bad play turned into a good play. Well, but I didn't know it at the time. I was just humiliated. I Aww. didn't know that it was going to turn into a good play. Well, it turned uh, but, <laughs> but, you, but you play. couldn't pull the plug on the public reading? No, no. It, I needed to have the full throttle public humiliation. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, but that's that's but common. If you, if, you, if you go back and take a look at uh, the way August Wilson worked uh, yes, at, uh, August. at the O'Neill Center, the first reading mm -hmm. was always the complete thing he brought, and the second day, 45 minutes would be cut. Maybe. <laughs> I was his stage manager for five years, Maybe. so I can but, say but, that. But, 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 yeah. well, but, but, only because but, but, only because it was hard for him yeah. to cut. But, I mean, but, he, but the he, story of uh, the story of uh, of Ma Rainey literally between the first and the second day he cut forty five minutes, and the second day he wow. had the good luck that Frank Rich came and saw it, and uh, that's how his uh, career was long. Uh, yeah, the second Frank, day. If you'd yeah. seen the first day. Maybe it, it, yeah, would, maybe it would never have taken off. Wouldn't have happened. Hmm. Well, but but, but he, he, you know, when they were in rehearsal with with Ma Rainey, Michael Feingold, and the and the original director, who I think maybe was uh, uh, Bill Partman, oh, really? uh, said, "These are, here's where the cuts are." And mm -hmm. and uh, August said, "You may very well be right. I have to hear everything." Mm -hmm. And he heard everything, and he said, "Okay, let's put the cuts that's, in." That's mm -hmm. interesting because Lloyd. Um, I did, I did Joe Turner piano lesson and two trains running as the PSM for, yeah. for the two of them. And Lo I remember Lloyd telling August, you have one scene too many yeah. in one of the plays, mm -hmm. I won't say which, but he didn't say which one. Yeah. He, he said, there's one scene you could lose in here, and he, which I actually think that that's more my way. I'm, I'm much more like... Mm -hmm. I think it's really your story. I'm, in, you know, because I think directing is interpretive, not the creative act. Actually, well, except that the, the thing that was fascinating about Lloyd, and since I've written a book about the O'Neill Center, and I'm now writing a book about Yale Rep, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm, I'm getting to know Lloyd better now yes. than I did when I knew him, uh, was that he was a, had a very strong dramaturgical hand. You go mm -hmm. back and, and read about the uh, development of Raisin in the Sun. Did you know that the original second part of Raisin took place in Clybourne Park? Oh, yes, yeah. And Lloyd said, I think, I think that it all takes place in, in, in the apartment, so why don't we just make that the play? <laughs> well, without Lloyd saying that, I doubt if we would have Raisin in mm -hmm, the Sun. Mm -hmm. And Lloyd always had that effect on, on August, looking for, the, uh, looking for clarity. Mm -hmm. But Lloyd also, which was a shock to me when I was researching uh, um, the O'Neill, which is my book about the O'Neill Center, was that I hadn't realized that Lloyd hadn't directed any of August's stuff at the O'Neill. No, yeah. He, I, he assigned white directors who mm -hmm. felt very 
why am I directing this when they, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but he felt that uh, they would come in with a colder, more objective eye and be more useful to August precisely because they weren't invested in the same way in the material and could come mm -hmm. at it more objectively. Mm -hmm. And August was distance. always very mm -hmm. articulate about what he felt he owed uh, Michael Feingold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, many, I think many people would, yeah. would concur. Yeah. yeah. About so, their own but, writing. but the, I, one of the things that I think we can, I, I suspect you might agree with me on, which is uh, that rather than looking around for what is out there that is useful to us, playwrights could take a more active hand in the development, in, in what they need out of their development. Well, I, I think that's I think that's true. But it, you know, to to each playwright is is his or her process, and they need to discover that for themselves. Yeah. You know, I remember when Richard Nelson came to Yale and we met for coffee, he told me, uh, he said, I'm not going to have any readings. I said, what do you mean? He said, I hate readings. We're not going to have any readings. I said, boy, that's sort of a personal decision, isn't it? And uh, he, they didn't have readings. So he projected his but, own pre prejudice on, uh, on a system that was might have been useful to other writers. Yeah, I mean, I have, I've, have, as I said, learned tremendous uh, amounts of my own uh, abilities and my own skill set by seeing readings at different stages of development. Um, uh, just just to finish up the, the heartbreaker story for a second, um, we did have this workshop at South Coast, and uh, I met with the artistic directors David Ems and Martin Benson and Jerry Patch, the dramaturg, after the reading of Heartbreaker, and they were very uncomfortable with giving me their feedback because clearly it wasn't it wasn't hitting the mark. And I said, guys, I don't want this to be my commission. Let's put this aside and let me start start over again. And they said, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, you know, I don't feel, I don't want to. I could have said, okay, here's my commission, goodbye, and I'll move on to my next thing. But I didn't feel right about that at all. And, uh, and I set it aside for what turned out to be maybe a few months. And I revisited it, and I made the crucial choice to make Jonathan Waxman a superstar artist as opposed to a struggling artist. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, I disassociated myself and my own autobiography and where I was mm -hmm. at the point in my development so that I could then ob objectively create a character named Jonathan Waxman who bore some resemblance to me but was not me and was not living my experience at all. I had to project a great deal onto his experience. So it was a tremendous learning experience to uh, to go through that process. It, it speaks to me, too, of the imperative uh, need for time yeah. and for people to allow playwrights to take risks and also give them the resources of collaborators to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think writing is so often such a solitary thing but of course we know it's imperative to work with other collaborators in the theater and and how much mm -hmm. time is so hard to come by because of money or life or whatever yes. and, and yeah. um, it, it speaks to me of how Im important these residencies are and these opportunities to just focus on the writing and the time and the risks. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's also very much, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's kind of a paradox because we do our writing largely in private, mm -hmm. but theater is a social form and we, I, at least I have found, I need community in order to, uh, in order to do the job properly. Donald and I had the benefit in the group that, uh, that we founded of being together about 10 years. Yeah. We met over every, every week except over the summer. We met every week. We had no... Every Monday night. We had we had no. we had no uh, uh, foundation support. We had no. We never filed a not for profit. We just met in each other's living rooms and sometimes donated space. And, and you he, had and you had actors that also yeah, they were part of the core them. group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of the people who came to us as an actor, when I, the, the, I, st I started the group because space became available mm -hmm. because I was disgusted with the, some groups that I'd been in, which had been run like the Ben Hur chariot race, <laughs> in, in which all the playwrights were competitive. And I thought there has to be a way in which we end up being friends and wanting to have coffee after the sessions. Because one group I was in, as soon as, as soon as the session was over, people scattered like roaches when you turned the light on and nobody went out for coffee. Mm -hmm. I thought that there was an index of a, a dysfunctional mm -hmm. group. 
And so I, mm -hmm. I, I met Donald because we had a mutual friend named Julius Novick, and I, 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 was, I was calling my friends to find out what writers were laboring in undeserved obscurity. And he said, well, there's this guy, he hasn't written more than 15 pages yet, but I think he's really got something. Well, I have a little bit. <laughs> oh, maybe a few no, more than that. That's, but what I read was what later became it was the first exploration right, of uh, what's wrong with this picture. No, no, uh, no, I think it was Powell's. No, I remember. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that. We're about that. to do our Larry. We're, we're going to do our Larry David do Larry. Uh, Anyway, I, what I remember is what. I, anyway, but also at that point, I was friendly with uh, with uh, David Mamet, and I said, "Who do you have to recommend?" And he said, "I'm not going to recommend a writer. I'm going to recommend the smartest actor, uh, I, young actor I know, is a, a woman named Jane Anderson." Mm. And I remember sitting with her in a coffee shop, and after 15 minutes of hearing her talk, I said, I think you're a writer. And she told me what I could do with myself and how violently I could do it. <laughs> and she said, she said I could, uh, she would come and she would, she would try to be useful as, as an actor. And she came in, and after three sessions, you turned to her and said, you're a writer. Yeah. And she wow. looked. Wow. Well, yeah. It, no, it was exciting. So we have you to thank for defying gravity. Well, yes. uh, both of us. Both, yes. both, no, no, no. Both of us. I'm but, no, but, you collectively. But what happened was that she looked at you and she looked at me and she thought we were in collusion to embarrass her. And she said, I'll prove I'm not a writer. I'll write something. And she went off and she came back with the monologue the next week, which was staggering. We said, you're a writer. Yeah. Mm. It, it was very exciting. But that was the great. We're not going to. We're not going to be too old for it. Talking about the writer's block. I promise. We're going to stop. Any we're going to do that. Jeffrey. Absolutely. But 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 but, 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 but the, yeah. the point was the point though the point was the pr the pressure of community meant yeah. that uh, that if we didn't we felt like schmucks if we didn't have something to bring to the next meeting and well, but it kept that, us writing. Yes, but mm -hmm. but the the larger the point that I was trying down. to make here yeah. is that. They were non-writers in a writer's group. Mm. We had directors, we had people who produced, we had mm -hmm. actors, so that writers acted for the first time by reading each other's work, mm -hmm. and actors wrote for the first time because that was part of the, that was part of our ritual. We began with something called six lines mm. every week. Mm. At the end of each session, we would throw out a topic for next week's six lines, and six lines was literally, I likened it to a haiku because originally it was, Three act, two actors, three exchanges each. A, B, A, B, A, B. And it would be like a little snippet. And everyone, people who had never written, would bring something in. Nobody could not write six lines. It was absolutely mm -hmm. compulsory. Mm -hmm. Everyone did. Okay. And uh, so that actors who had never written did. Jane among them. And uh, it, it, was, it was thrilling because then... What it did was, and it's something that I think is a really strong marker for creating a cohesive group, it made everyone committed to the group. Mm -hmm. Because the, I had a similar experience with writers groups before Jeffrey and I met, uh, which was that everybody's there for their own purpose, and then they leave, or they only show up when they have something to present, which is a lousy way to create a trust, trusting environment. But what was great about the block was that people said, oh, I can't wait to hear my six lines this week. Or you're writing it for particular members of the group, whether they were actors or writers or actor writers. Mm -hmm. And so many of my early plays came out of those six lines, mm -hmm. where they were just exchanges between people whose voices were in my head because I was hearing them every week and trusting them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so many of my early work came out and of we that. Started to so cheat, was, we started to cheat. It's, it ceased to be six lines. It could be anything under two pages. Right. And the other thing was that Nobody criticized the six lines. Right. It was just we just bang, went around bang, the room. Bang, 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 bang. There was no but, feedback. Right. But it, mm -hmm. but it meant that everybody every week was involved. So it right. gave everybody a reason to show up every week. Yeah. And mm -hmm. this was not done with any conscious. Oh, if we do this, that will happen. This just happened. It did, and it was a miracle. It was it was an incredible group. Uh, yeah. But but that sense of that. The thing I was trying to say was the dichotomy of writing as individuals, but having the access to and, and regular pressure from and expectation from a community was, I think, uh, yeah. key. And yeah. the community lasted for a long time and was only essentially broken up by the number of people who then moved to Los Angeles or, in one case, New Haven. Right. And, I, that, and that was by basically oh, it. Yeah. You, you yeah. I, I host a, a group once a month uh, at the Playwright Center. And what has become really amazing is that with technology, people can join uh -huh. from afar via webcam. So right. we'll have a group of 10 or 12 people in the room and then another six online. 
And um, similarly, it's a group of writers, member writers, who meet and we take turns reading each other's work and discussing it. But what's amazed me over the years that I've been there is that whether we're reading people's plays or not, people keep coming back. The same mm -hmm. people keep coming back. And they're reading the lines as actors, even though most of them aren't, and they're you know writers. Mm -hmm. But they like um, the community. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we won't get to their play for six months. But they still really? keep coming, because they just want to right. have people they can identify with who are in the trenches like they are, who may or may not be having these same experiences. And they're at all different levels. Some of them are very early writers. And some of them are much more established and have had work produced. And um, so, if if I may, we are streaming right now on HowlRound. Can you would you share? How can people become a part of that? Yeah. That, so um, um, this is at the Playwright Center, and um, anyone can become a member. You can join online, but uh, whether you are a member or not, you can join this group by emailing me, and you can find my email address at the Playwright Center. So. Mm -hmm. um, it, that's the other wonderful thing about it is that it doesn't have to be a member playwright to come. Mm -hmm. We won't read your play if you aren't a member, but you can certainly sit around the room and have a conversation. And it's been wild that that community has grown, even though we are not always focusing mm -hmm. on those people's work. And, and, how, and how do, do people have to submit work to become members, or they just submit they dues can, and become yes, a member? Yes, submit dues. Uh -huh. Yeah. But to get to the other aspect of this, which is, uh, okay, we've talked a little bit about development and there are various different methods uh, for development, various mm -hmm. different groups and stuff. Uh, the problem of A, launching a play, and B, once the play is launched, if it isn't instantly embraced yeah. and, right. and, 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 and becomes August Osage County, what the hell do you do? Um, yeah. I think one thing which has been <laughs> lucky, which I've had luck with, and I, and I can't prescribe it for everybody because it means you have to have access to certain people. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a, a play which I wrote in the block in which Donald read the lead for for me as I was writing it, a play called The Value of Names. Uh, and I had the great good luck many years later that Jack Klugman became obsessed with this play and whenever anybody asked him to do something he said, no, but how about we do Value of Names and he ended up doing six productions of it. And I can tell you that people weren't doing the play necessarily because they wanted to do my play, but because they wanted Jack Klugman. And I didn't mind that in the least. No. Mm -hmm. How did you meet him? How I did. did I, 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 there was a guy named James Glossman, who's a director <laughs> who's absolutely shameless. Yeah. Uh, and James will will contact anybody, and he doesn't care who says no to him, and he'll mm -hmm. get through to them. And he. He, that seems to be what it takes I, from the director's point I of view. You I just have, have to, to keep bashing at people he, he, until he they will, really he, look he at will the just keep, He will just keep going until he gets <laughs> them. And he got, I remember uh, John Aston ended up doing three productions of uh -huh. one of my plays because of James and, and Dan Loria. And, uh -huh. uh, and, uh, and yeah. James just... And you never asked me. Huh? You never asked me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> You're now about the right age I am to play the part. Yeah. That's, that, that's but, interesting. But I, I have to just interject here because I have a Jack Klugman story. Oh, okay. yes. Briefly. Well, he, told is, me, he told me his version of it. Well, Jack Klugman, <laughs> who at this point had no voice left, yeah. God bless him, mm -hmm. called me. I'd never met him. And he said, that play has collected stories. You ever think of having two guys? Mm -hmm. I said, no. <laughs> he said, would you think about it? I said, no. Yeah. <laughs> I, said, it's, I said, Jack, it's a completely different play with two men. Mm -hmm. But it was very fun, funny. He was always trying to figure out well, something. He, he, he loved the stage. And he just. Yeah. And, and, and the, the well, and Dan Loria. Dan Loria is somebody who yeah. really cares about new play development and will dedicate his time to it, will give, it, give, it, give him, of himself generously. And Long his record of, uh, of having readings of new works out exactly. in Los Angeles. So, yeah. yeah. No, but, uh, but, but, uh, but the, the, the biggest piece of advice that I have, well, not the biggest, but one of the biggest is uh, to new writers is find, a, find a, a passionate, smart, and well-connected director because the director will be more used to you than an agent. Mm -hmm. I guess I've I'm not well-connected enough yet. <laughs> I, got, I mean, I'm well, talking personally about the things like, and, and yeah, Mari is well, in this situation, Mari is too. in this position. Now. People bring you plays, this. and you as a director slash producer, how are you able to... You know, I think it's a an art for sure of mm -hmm. trying to figure out which new plays that you're passionate about mm -hmm. match the theaters that you have relationships with, mm -hmm. you know, where they might consider doing a production. 
and you know, every, each theater has its own mission and mandate. As and I know, as the Playwright Center is often in this position as well of trying to to do this kind of matchmaking, mm -hmm. where the theater will say, "Well, we, we do new plays, but we don't do premieres. <laughs> mm -hmm. We want the play that has been done in New York, yeah. but." You know, is not a premiere, but is less than five years old. But, you know, they, they have all of these stipulations, yeah. and then yeah. you're thinking, okay, what are the plays that I'm passionate about that might possibly fit mm. all of these criteria? Um, and they have good reasons for those mm -hmm. criteria. I, as Karen said, I do think we've kind of trained our audiences in certain mm -hmm. ways to expect the net, you know, so if you would live in a, a Midwestern town, you might expect something that's premiered in the last five years in New York. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, because we've trained that expectation, then the artistic director was trying to fill that expectation mm -hmm. with, but there are only so many plays that have been premiered in the last five years in New York. As a director, a lot of times, the next production will be directed by the same person who premiered it in New York. So mm -hmm. I might look at it and go, well, I, I'm, I probably can't pitch that play because right. um, it's already, you know, that yeah. one's probably spoken for, but maybe mm -hmm. this one that, you know, but, isn't. But what I'm wondering though is, is uh, the phrase premiered in New York uh, sort of uh, uh, a euphemism for well received by the New York Times. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and also, more often think. than not, the plays that have been so-called premiered in New York have, yeah. in fact, premiered in New York, but right. they've been uh, grown someplace else and then brought to New York. Well, it, I, I it, did a premiere, yeah. uh, a New York premiere of a play, uh, Jason O'Dell Williams Handle with Care, uh, off Broadway. About, I guess it was a year and a half or so ago now. It had been developed at the Kitchen. Uh, in Ithaca, it had been developed at Florida Studio Theater, I think. I'm sorry, Jason, if I'm getting the name of it, the theater wrong. Um, but it handled with care was this beautiful play that uh, luckily there were a couple of commercial producers that were willing mm. to commit to doing it, knowing it was this beautiful story that would play, play very mm -hmm. well with, with audiences in New York. Uh, committed to doing it even though it wasn't technically the world premiere of the play. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and I was not the original director of those other two productions, but I have empathy for the people who did direct those productions because I displaced them mm. um, because I had some notoriety because of Nora's work, the work I did with Nora and Delia. Um, but that play could have never been done in New York. It could have easily fallen mm -hmm. in one direction or the other. It's, it's mm -hmm. great if you have somebody who is an endorsing figure. Mm -hmm. if, you don't have, if you don't have a, a profile of yourself, if you have a, either an actor or a director who's got, who's got a profile and, and will get people interested in something. Mm -hmm. um, I think you ha almost have to have that. You know, and, and the person who endorses you, the higher the higher they are placed in this in the they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're the people who are going to get the phone call answered yeah you know they're the true. people that these theaters want to have come as it would be associated with the with with their companies mm -hmm. um, so I do but, want but to that mean but that means what I was saying before that the playwright has to be a social figure and has to know these people I'm sorry mm -hmm. it's not it's not enough to be a good writer half the job is being part of the community which means being interested in other people's work. Mm -hmm. Since if you aren't interested in other people's work, why should anybody be interested in yours? Um, so and, being and out there and in the thick of it, and it, you know, attending mm -hmm. things like we're we're all here at this and, be, and becoming the familiar festival. with with potential directors and potential mm -hmm. actors that you want to work mm -hmm. with. And also, I feel a great I, responsibility to see as much work as possible now, yeah. wherever I am. Like you mm -hmm. know, I'm after the festival. I'm going up to Kansas City to see whatever's being done in Kansas City. But, but, but mm -hmm. let, let's remember, you know, we're here at the at the Inge Festival. Let's remember how Inge's career got started. It got mm -hmm. started because he interviewed Tennessee Williams. They became friends, and right. Williams endorsed Inge and brought That's Inge true. to New York. It, uh, you know, there are countless acts of generosity of, of artists to other artists, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of this depends on. Mm -hmm. On, on kindness and generosity, and I think most of the writers that I know have that. There are very few that I know that operate on the Ben Hur principle mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of running each other off the road. I'm, I'm, I think mm -hmm. writers have been uh, among the most generous and supportive of, of each other people mm -hmm. that I know. But getting to know the director is much more important, I find, than having the right agent. Well, you know, mm -hmm. uh, even though my career was, was up and coming, uh, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, Claudia Weil was the director who uh, heard about me or something, mm -hmm. maybe even through the writer's block, I don't remember the series of events, but mm -hmm. 
I gave her uh, my play Found a Peanut. Mm. Uh, and it was Claudia who took it to Joe Papp. Mm. I mean, Joe, I, my agent could have sent it to Joe Papp, but it wouldn't have had the same value if it had not been handed to him by a director that Joe at that time was cultivating, that Claudia. Who she had, had already been. She was a, you know, she had made her name in, in independent film mm -hmm. at the forefront of independent film, yeah. really, mm -hmm. and, uh, and was sort of, had already been burned by the studio system and was looking to get back into theater, which is what she, where she began. Mm -hmm. And we met in the early 80s. We met probably in 82 or 83 and found a peanut was one of those miracles where uh, Claudia fell in love with the play and said, can I show this to Joe Papp? I said, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, well, that would be, yeah. But of course, showing something to Joe Papp meant showing it to Gail Papp. Mm -hmm. And Gail, thank the Lord, loved the play <laughs> and kept on saying, Joe, you have to read this, you have to read this, yeah. kid, you have to read this. And uh, we had the reading of Found a Peanut for Joe, and it was after that reading in his office that he said, I love this play, I'm going to do this play. That doesn't happen very often. This is like the stuff of Warner Brothers, you know. But but this musicals. is this, this is something else, which it's is that a, most producers don't know how to read, and and so to have a good reading to have a good reading is, is essential. Is, is, yeah. Yeah, but what I'm getting at is that if Claudia hadn't brought it to Joe, yeah, uh, I might not, never have gotten his attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so. so getting to know directors and having a good yeah. relationship with good directors. Um, I, enormous number of the productions I've gotten have happened because directors have taken place to artistic directors rather than my submitting to a mm -hmm. theater. Mm -hmm. You right. submit to a theater and you end up being uh, handed off to the uh, to the readers that the literary manager has. And, uh, and, and, and it Not that we have anything nothing. against those former no. students of mine. Uh, 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 yes, no, we love them. But, but, it, but, but that was true at the Old Globe. But, we had, but, but, we had so many scripts but that what we you had to do have is a committee you're, lo you're looking for the most direct route to the person who can make the decision. Mm -hmm. And the most direct route to the person who can make the decision is, are those directors that that artistic director likes to work with. And it means you have to do the research and find out who those directors are. Mm -hmm. You can get to them or you have some sense of who that theater wants to work with. And if you have something that can, can be matched with uh, an artist that they want to work with, and that's your, your best shot, which means you have to yeah. be aware. You have to do your research. Mm -hmm. um, and also the play has to fit the mission or you know whatever the theater is about right um, I mean I've had the great good fortune no. having developed the festival and honoring you this year and honoring Jen Silverman another wonderful wonderful writer who is getting the Otis, Ger Otis Guernsey new voices award this year mm. um, I've gotten to interview many of your collaborators some of them have been producers so you know then I get to talk to them about they're curious about what I'm up to I mm -hmm. think they're I hope producers and having been one, I think I can say this, and being one at the moment also, um, have to develop a healthier curiosity about what's not in their camp at the moment. Mm. Because there are many other writers out there. I mean, Jen Silverman is very young. Uh, she was awarded the Yale Prize last year uh, for her play Still, um, mm. which was a, a I think a thousand scripts were submitted for that competition, yeah. uh, and she was a peer chosen. This was a peer chosen award, the Otis Guernsey Award here at the Inch Festival. Jen's a young writer, and she's gotten several things have happened in the in this year, and she's you know she's in her twenty. I mean, yeah, she's young anyway. Mm. Is the point? Um, and I and I hope that director that producers will look at her work. Um, but I, but I don't think they'll look at her work until she's, pre as she is right now, premiering at Humana, and this is happening, yeah, and this is happening, yeah. and she's in sort of the zeitgeist of. But that's how careers are built. Yes. yes. You know, and it, it's an accretion of these kinds of events and mm -hmm. these accolades. Mm -hmm. uh, people begin to pay more attention. I think that you know, and this is true in any art, art form, that you need the imprimatur of some notable marker an arbiter of taste mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. in order to validate the work that you then, oh, well, we should take a look at that. Mm -hmm. it, and it's been under your nose all along, but wait, no, it didn't get that rave review from Charles Isherwood yet. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's why you know the public-private dichotomy of being an artist in any genre is, is such a, a confounding one, because you need to do the work, and you mm -hmm. also need to as Jeff says, you need to be out there. And I don't mean in a political way. I mean, you need to absorb it. You need to be seen. You need to meet people. 
uh, you need to be stimulated by what's in the marketplace, and you need to have reality check of what is marketable. Because we're not just doing this for ourselves, we want to have careers in our field, and you have to get a sense of, well, what, what are people responding to? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't well, mean to not, suggest you're that not, you're pandering, no. but you just not need to for know what you're writing because you need to write something. But yeah, sure, there. but you'd also like to make it your life's work because it is something you love to do, or it is the thing you love to do, mm -hmm. and the thing you're gifted for. Well, yeah, but yeah, I mean, I had Julius Novick in my life, who, when I was a 20-year-old, did you seek him arts, out? Did you seek him out? Well, Jay taught. Dramatic literature at Purchase. I was a student at SUNY Purchase in visual art. I have a BFA in visual art, period. I didn't, I don't have a master's in anything. And I was interested in playwriting and I knocked on Jay's door and introduced myself as a, as a visual art student and I would love to study playwriting and would you sponsor me in a playwriting tutorial? And Jay said, have you ever written a play before? And I said, no. He said, I'd love to sponsor you in a tutorial. <laughs> so we developed this instant rapport, a meeting with Jay at least once a week. And I wrote like a house of fire. It was really thrilling. And Jay said, you're good at this. You should do this. Now, I think any 20-year-old kid who's trying his or her hand at an art form, being told that by a mentor, mm -hmm. that's gold. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's it's life changing. Would you talk a little bit about, if you would, um, your experience with you know when you first were starting in New York, you did a play off off Broadway, is my understanding, yeah, before Found a Peanut. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. what was how did that come about, and what was your experience with that production? The first production I had in New York City was in 1992. It was a commission from the Jewish Repertory Theater. Mm -hmm. Uh, someone named Ed Cohen, Ed, Edward M. Cohen, was the literary manager of uh, the Jewish Repertory Theater, but he was also reading scripts for Playwrights Horizons. And I had submitted a play of mine called Pals, which Jeff was very much a, a witness to during his development, uh, because it came out of the writer's block. And Pals, even though it was never produced, got me a lot of attention. Uh, and. You know, it's it's sort of a, a Brooklyn luncheonette genre play, if you know. <laughs> okay. and uh, but it got me a lot of attention. It, even though it didn't get me productions, it, it won me some advocates in literary offices in New York. And uh, Ed Cohen had read Pals. We met as a result of that, and it was at that time that he and the actress Florence Stanley, the late actress Florence mm -hmm. Stanley were putting together a bill of one act plays by Delmore Schwartz, right. who would figure as an offstage presence in collected stories. Um, and uh, I read Schwartz's, he, he, a Jewish rep wanted to commission an adaptation of a Schwartz short story to be on a double bill with Schwartz's own obscure play called Shenandoah, which was about the naming of a Jewish child. His parents are so desperate to assimilate their child. They call him Shenandoah because it seems like a quintessentially American name. <laughs> it's, it's, and it's a novelty play, really. Yeah. It's, a, it's a curiosity. Uh, and they wanted to produce that because it had never been seen in New York. But it was only an hour long or 50 minutes long. So I was commissioned to write an adaptation of a short, short story. I read the collection in Dreams Begin Responsibilities and other yeah. stories. And mm -hmm. I fell in love with the story in Dreams Begin Responsibilities. Uh, which is a, a just a, an astonishing story uh, about the young Delmore uh, on the eve of his 21st birthday is having a dream in which he imagines his uh, parents' courtship in Coney Island that led to his and his sister's birth. And it was a disastrous marriage. And it's this little story, and it's a, a beautiful conceit. And uh, do you want to share that with us? Yeah, I'll tell you in well, a second. Okay. It's just a question from okay, the web. Great. We're, we're okay. getting questions well, through this, so it's okay. reading it. So, um, so I ended up adapting yeah. Luna Park from mm -hmm. In Dreams Begin Responsibilities. Luna Park became my first New York production in 1982. Mm -hmm. I, I, I remember going to it. Yeah, I mm -hmm. bet you do. Yeah. And, uh, and it did nothing for my career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, just in terms of the building blocks of the career, it was very important for me in terms of confidence and having a play produced. And I remember the, the dear Marion Seldes came to see it. And mm. I remember her 
mm. bowing and, and, and welcoming to the Ameri me to the American theater mm. because she was such a delightful she, character. She, she, she was, that was, that was, that was part of her official role in the she, American theater. Yes, she, to, she, was, she, she anointed her me. arms and, yeah. and, and, yeah. and I was yeah. quite great. Right. But, um, when you say it did nothing for you, did you? It didn't lead to anything. Did it? Was it? Was it did critics see it? No. No. Okay. No. Uh, I Joe Hurley of uh, who wrote for uh, a, a third string, uh, you know, East Village paper, um, gave it a nice little capsule review, and I think that was the only review that I got. It's the New York Times didn't come. It's a beautiful play. Never really produced. Students do it. Oh, but I haven't yeah. had a production of that play since 1982. So what was your first play that was critically reviewed in New York, and what happened? Uh, first play critically reviewed was, was Gifted Children, mm -hmm. another play that came out of the writer's block, mm -hmm. uh, which was produced with Zora Lampert and Dinah Manoff mm -hmm. at the Jewish Rep. They produced my first full-length play in 1983, and I had the misfortune of having Frank Rich come to see a play that he shouldn't have seen. And he gave me a very uh, disparaging review. Mm -hmm. And that was my New York uh, That was your baptism, mm -hmm. but in a way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then uh, just a, maybe six months after that, uh, Joe Papp produced Found a Peanut. And Frank Rich came to see that and gave that a very meh review. Uh, and then six months after that, I mean, things were happening. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. But I wasn't getting, I wasn't arriving. I was always sort of pulling into the station and then driving on. Uh, <laughs> and then What's Wrong With This Picture was already, there was a commitment from Manhattan Theatre Club to do What's Wrong With This Picture. Uh, in a play that Claudia directed, a production Claudia directed with Evan Handler and Florence Stanley and Bob Dishy and yeah. uh, Madeline Kahn, God bless her, and mm -hmm. uh, Marsha Jean Kurtz, Salem Lud Ludwig. Salem. And, uh, and it wasn't working. The production wasn't working, and um, some of it was my fault. Some of it was a casting error, and um, and I just I just felt that if I'd opened the play to critics, that it would have signaled the end of my New York career. That I, not that I would have thrown up my hands and given up writing. I probably would have moved to Los Angeles, and um, so I didn't open the play which was a very controversial decision. You didn't uh, open it, meaning to critics. you still had public audiences. It was part of the subscription at Manhattan Theater Club when mm -hmm. they were still on 73rd Street. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we played our run. We lost a week to cast illness, which was part of what plagued that production. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I didn't open it and you know, had, went into a depression after that. Oh. And, uh, but that's huge. That, yeah. um, and also that Lynn... Lynn Meadows supported that. She idea. did. There was not an, uh, yeah. not without its controversy. Of course, of yes. course. I'm it sure was, she. Yeah. yeah. Because I'm sure it meant the difference yeah. between it running just for yeah. subscription or being extended yeah. or what have you. Yeah. Lynn and I have had a fabulous, very long, complicated relationship. A an amazing relationship. Yes, you we have, really have You have many homes. You must. I do. Uh, no, you I, must I, be I, a home kind of guy. You know. No. Uh, uh, we have a question from the internet. Uh, oh, forgive me there's for somebody out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, and by the way, if you want to submit a question to us, yeah. um, you can do so on ha at hashtag InchFest, all lowercase letters, I-N-G-E-F-E-S-T, hashtag InchFest. Um, this is a question from Robert Mana. It says, for an emerging playwright with a breakthrough play, risk giving the premiere to a tiny theater for development versus time spent trying for a larger production. Can you being our, our um, writers at the table. Can I, you talk a little bit about that? It's, um, it's not just a question of size. I think it's a, if, you, if you feel that you found somebody who, who's a good artist, who's a good, good collaborator, that's mm -hmm. the thing. It's not size. Mm -hmm. uh, my, uh, my breakthroughs came working with people that had never received any particular coverage at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so you would say go to production, I, whatever I, I, production I'd you can say, get. I'd, not a, whatever production you can get. I'd say go if, if, if you have the confidence that you're working with good people and somebody that you're going to learn from and somebody who's going to uh, going to do good work with you. Don't just do production for the sake of production because mm -hmm. that's that that's likely to be disastrous. But yes. look for the quality of the people and don't worry about the future. See if you can work with good people and learn something from them. Well, you know, I think that particularly for young talent. I think that, uh, and particularly in this age of Lena Dunham, mm -hmm. uh, I'm only using her as an example of overnight stardom. 
She really was, in, she, and she's phenomenal. I, yeah. I think she's tremendous. But, but, but she's set a pattern that people. She has, she has set, I, as a teacher of young people, yeah. that she is very much on the radar of young people who want to leave Yale University with a spec script or a producible play or whatever. It, it's, it's created a sort of false expectation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that what happens is, and I could speak as a, a warrior who had, had, was supposed to have arrived you know, at least five different times before I arrived. Mm. Mm. And then I didn't even feel that I arrived, because mm. you have to constantly prove I arrived. You, you, you but, but, but anyway, I, I think there's far too much importance placed on the overnight success. Yeah. And I think it's very important for young talent mm. to see their work, to work on it, to learn how to do it. It's like falling in love and having sexual relationships. You have to learn how to do it. <laughs> you don't just do it. Mm -hmm. It takes uh, practice. It takes practice. Mm -hmm. It takes experience. Mm -hmm. And I think there's too much, too much impact is placed on being that overnight success. Mm -hmm. So that I think that a young person may have something that may truly be talented, mm -hmm. uh, may not be his or her ticket, mm -hmm. and they should at least not deny themselves the experience of working on it with people in a real environment. I I also think talent wills out. I think if the play has power, and if there are good people working on yeah. it, it will prevail. It, it will catch it, it, fire. It, it, it if will it's tend seen. to. I mean, I, I know I know of people who I thought were gifted who just didn't have the sensibility of applying themselves as Donald is talking mm -hmm. about. They, yeah. they, 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 well, I tried it. It didn't work. Boom, and they and they and they bail out. And, and tenacity is part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that you know if. if if you're focusing on breaking through and making a success, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. If you're focusing on learning what you need to learn as a writer and working with good people, uh, frequently the byproduct of that is that other people will know. But it's, it's I hate to say it's a Zen thing, but it, it is. Yeah. Well, but let me just let me just add a caveat to, to this young writer's uh, question. Mm -hmm. um, don't sign away mm -hmm. the rights to your play to a fledgling company. Oh, because yeah. if the play does go anywhere else, you are encumbered to that company, which will make it less attractive to another more established company to pick up that play. Mm -hmm. So be really cautious about that. You should become a member of the Dramatist Guild if you aren't already. Because yes. they, the Guild is designed to protect writers from these situations. Um, so on one hand, don't deny yourself the experience of seeing the play done. But also don't sign away its, uh, its, its future. Don't mortgage its future on that experience. Mm -hmm. But sometimes wonderful productions happen in smaller theaters, that, and those can often have an ongoing life. I'm thinking of most recently uh, the Boston Court Theater in LA did Everything You Touch, Sheila Callahan's new play, mm -hmm. which then moved to New York not, in not exactly the same production, but with the same director and a lot of the same team mm -hmm. and did well there. So um, I think that can happen, mm -hmm. and it, it's certainly better to get a production at a smaller theater than to have your play sit in kind of the reading yes. hell, well, which well, can sometimes th happen, where you have reading after reading after yes. reading and workshop yes. after workshop. And it kind and of self-perpetuates. It's yeah. like, You okay, become well, the playwright who does reading. The, yeah. the, the other thing is that the smaller production generally has less money involved in it, so the less, the, the larger the budget, the more pressure on you to change things to, to commercial pressures to change mm -hmm. the play to make it more palatable to a yeah. larger audience. Mm -hmm. the, the happiest times I've, I've had mostly have been in places where the budgets have been the smallest and in which no, nobody's bankroll is riding on the success or failure of the play. Mm -hmm. And those That's are the a really important point. Those yeah. are the plays mm -hmm. uh, that ended up actually being the ones of mine that are, have ended up being the most produced or the ones that started off in the lowest budget productions where there was no pressure to do anything except good work. Mm -hmm. Right. You can um, take greater risks, too. Mm -hmm. Well, I, yeah. I mean, I, I, I was lucky. I, my, my breakthrough was a, was a, 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 an hour and ten minute play called Porch. And uh, it was done, there was a, a small off-off-Broadway theater devoted to musical theater called the Encompass Theater, and they were doing, I had recommended that they do uh, uh, Mark Blitzstein's Regina, which is the opera based on mm -hmm. Little Foxes. And I had forgotten that there was a scene in Regina that took place on a, a front porch. And as they were rehearsing, I saw this porch set and I said, 
wait a second, for 50 cents more, you could do my show on the dark nights. <laughs> yeah. And the producers... I didn't know for 50 cents, yeah. yeah. That's good. And, and, That's and, attractive. And, and Nancy Rhodes said, if you can figure out some way to, to rehearse it so it doesn't cost me a dime, she says, I'll put it up. So because of that accident, it was put up, and because I had published a book about Second City that uh, Richard Eder had read and liked, on a night when he was free, he came and I got a, cr a review from the first string critic of the New York Times on this thing that had been rehearsed in a loft and it cost nothing to put up, and mm -hmm. that, was, mm -hmm. that was my breakthrough. It was upstairs from a strip club. Where Which is in, where the writer's block first that's met. Where we, and, no. that, and that's why we met was same because... Same room? The, yeah, the same room. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was no money involved and there was no expectation that we were going to, that mm -hmm. we were going to get covered. Mm -hmm. um, it's so you, you also weren't under pressure to, as you said, like to change the play. You, you, it was of your own making. No, it was it actually it was very, very fu funny because the the cast and I had a tremendous cast said, "Don't tell us when the critics are coming." And one night there was a, they were performing and there was this guy who was leaning into into the light and had a yellow pad and was writing things on the yellow pad and they were furious. They thought, who is this schmuck who's being so rude that they're disrupting the performance? By st and the, the, afterwards, uh, uh, Polly Adams turned to me and said, we almost stopped the show and said, do your homework at home. <laughs> I said, well, I'm glad you didn't do that because that was Richard Eater of the New York Times. <laughs> and Eater gave it the, the review that, uh, that uh, essentially got my, my career started. I also think we should talk a little bit about uh, the National New Play Network. Uh, I know Nan Barnett's been to the Inge Festival, and uh, I think this marvelous, this idea of the rolling premieres. I remember a TCG conference in which, I think it was Che Yu and I were sitting together, and it was this brown bag lunch about this very thing, about new play development, and um, and Che and I were sort of sidebarring while the thing was going on, because it was a huge group of people. Everybody was in that one big lobby area, and he said, my problem is the second production always. This was before the National New Play Network, play work, network came into being. You know, um, and I kept thinking mm -hmm. about having worked on August and August's work with Lloyd over the span of five years. And each of those plays had years in production, in, in rolling from one regional theater to the next. And this is Ben Mordecai, the brilliant Ben Mordecai, was our executive producer. Um, his idea to do this joint, <laughs> jointly produced regional production that went from to Arena Stage and then to the Huntington and then to Seattle Rep and then Goodman. to the Old Globe, yeah. exactly, and then rolled on to Broadway. But there was actually no plans to bring it to Broadway when that began. That was about really sounding the play out. Mm -hmm. Lloyd said, I, wanted, I want to do it over a span of time. And those actors and those companies were together for a year, a year and a half, two years, and that, and their their work got incredibly rich and deep. And you know, and, 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 and and the the story was that every every stop, uh, August cut ten or fifteen minutes more. I remember. Sort of. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he never wanted to decide on the ending for the piano lesson. Yeah. I think that was the biggest yeah. cut. Uh, but but it, but in essence, what that. he was doing, what they were doing, was recreating in a nonprofit world what used to obtain in the commercial world, which right. was the uh, the out of town tryout, where you would go from the from city to city, and uh, mm -hmm. what you saw in Boston was different than what was seen in Detroit than was seen in uh, in Washington. Mm -hmm. And plays were made and saved on the road in front of audiences, and you can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Nobody has the, the dough to well, do those Well, with things. the new play exactly. network, to some extent, you can, I think. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's a wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful program. Could I, you talk a little bit about um, yeah, it? I mean, I, I don't know extensively about it, but I, I know that, it um, I mean, I saw Octavio Solis's Sayama Cristina in the LA production, I know it was also done in San Francisco. I'm not sure of all mm -hmm. the other cities, but basically Is it a through this program, uh, I think at least three. Karen, maybe you know better than I. Um, uh, three companies have to agree to do the play, exactly. and then it gets separate premieres. What and what I have heard about Octavio's play was that it, the premieres were extremely different. Yes, um, they, they usually are. You know, the production in LA had this fantastic conceptual sort of set that was done by the artist Grok, um, and it was done in a completely realistic production elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So he got, and his play is very poetic, you could see how it could go in different directions. Mm -hmm. So this, net, this network was developed where a bunch of sort of sister theaters, or brother, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. a bunch of theaters uh, were uh, 
developed into, were, were consciously developed into a network that would agree to all say, this is the rolling premiere of this work. And um, it's kind of slightly different than the, the August Wilson plays, which were a production that travels, you know, a, a company that goes and the production that goes. Um, but in this case, uh, each a, a different director in each of those theaters, uh, yeah, different yeah, interpretation. The, the, of the play. That was essentially also, I don't know, we go back to ancient history, but that's what happened with the history of the American film, which went at uh, it Chris was, Durant. It, it, it was done at uh, at uh, the O'Neill Center, and everybody wanted to do it. And uh, Durang and his agents had the idea of having three different productions: uh, one in D.C., one in L.A., and I can't remember what the third one was. And then Chris and his uh, people mixed and matched mm -hmm. for what eventually opened in New York and uh, was underappreciated in New York. But he had the experience of seeing three different uh, uh, productions, mm -hmm. entirely separate productions that uh, he cannibalized for the uh, for the final production. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's beautiful about that also is that, um, you know, getting back to this question of the developmental process, mm -hmm. um, I think you probably agree that playwrights sometimes need readings, and certain playwrights very much respond to them, but some playwrights feel like they really need to see their work fully produced. Mm -hmm. yeah. and some plays are just more conducive to production than readings. Mm -hmm. um, and I think his play in particular, which I also saw as a reading, Octavio's play, um, was really hard to get from a reading. It's very poetic. Mm -hmm. It's kind of abstract, mm -hmm. and you know, it's the kind of thing. It's kind of like listening to a reading of Godot. You're you're, yeah. you're struggling to figure out what this yeah. would be. A table reading of Godot would not reveal what that play is. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, but, but I think but it was what fantastic I think you're saying is that mm -hmm. it's not that we need to find a process that there is no one process that's going to work for every script. Every script has to be developed uh, according to its own particular attributes. Right, mm -hmm. uh, and. One of the things that I'm heartened by is that the uh, the O'Neill Center did very well with their sort of one size fits all for, for a number of years. Mm -hmm. But what Wendy Goldberg has been doing to, to change that is to say, well, different plays require different things at the O'Neill now, and we're right. going to tailor it more. Lloyd used to be adamant about not having any props in the in the readings, and mm -hmm. and and you practically had to go. Through to a review board before you were allowed <laughs> a prop. And, 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 and Wendy's a little looser about that. She'll mm -hmm. even occasionally allow real furniture on the stage where Lloyd said, no, cubes only. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I, I think it just recognizes that different plays require frequently different paths to, uh, to development, that one size does not fit all. Mm -hmm. and, but also that you should consult the playwrights in figuring, because there's, there's something that bugs the hell out of me, and I don't know whether you've encountered this, uh, probably not lately, but the uh, infantilization of the playwright or the assumption that the playwright mm -hmm. is too stupid to understand that somehow you've given birth to it and now other people are going to protect the play from the playwright. Right. Oh. Well, I see an awful lot of that where, where you, you, you just wrote it, you don't understand what it means and you don't know what it, and this assumption that, uh, that playwrights are not adults. Uh, which well, I think, yes, I think that, that is true, particularly in early, early on uh, in, in one's career. There's far too much of this infantilization, as Jeffrey calls it, that, that playwrights have to be nurtured. I, I bristle so at the, that phrase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I do think it is a matter of self-knowledge. You, you begin to figure out, what do you need? Mm -hmm. What do you need? Which, which renders the, the playwright more active and less passive and less susceptible to negative influence. I bet I, but I think also there, there's a strain in which a lot of artists, and I come, certainly actors are like this too, think that they have to wait for somebody to give them to permission to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's just death. You just sit around lolling around on a lily pad trying to look attractive, waiting for somebody to say, you're the one. Well, no, start your, start your own process. Mm -hmm. right. If there isn't a process out there that's good, stepping up to, the ba uh, yeah. up to bat, then put together your own bloody reading. And it doesn't really cost that much mm -hmm. to, to, to create your own developmental process. Mm -hmm. And for that matter, um, actors and directors are always looking for something to work on, something, something of value to work on. They're very generous people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yes, but you have to be in the world in order to do that. Yeah, you have to have credibility, and yeah. part of it is by, by being interested in other people's work and being part of the uh, part of the community. Well, or, or you make your own world, like you did with the writer's block. Yes, but you we found but, but we were absolutely interested in each other's work. Yes. The, the writer's block. What'd you say? It's thirty-seven years ago that we did we, we did the writer's Stop block. Stop with that. <laughs> we're, still, we're still, even even though it's been atomized and we've gone to different corners, there's still a connection between most of us who were who were there together. Yeah. You know, uh, we're Donald and I are still friendly with Jane Anderson. We're well, still Jane is we, one of my best friends in the world. We're still, you know, I, I saw her in Los Angeles three or four weeks ago mm -hmm. to interview. Her but you were program. nobodies. You were nobodies oh, when you started. That, absolutely. Right? Well, and the so, only somebodies in our group were uh, Anne Mira and Jerry Stiller. Yeah. Yes. Yes. were the uh, nominal parent figures mm -hmm. in our group. Well, and, mm -hmm. what, what happened is I'd written a book about Second City yeah. Improvisational Theater, and I invited Mark and Bobby Gordon, who had been members of the Compass Players. Mm -hmm. And Mark and Bobby said, hey, our friends Jerry Stiller and Ann Mira <laughs> would be interested. Do you think you'd be interested in having it? Sure, invite them along. <laughs> I said, no, absolutely yeah. not. But they, yeah. but they came in and were absolutely, we had the benefit of having four bona fide, well, well experienced adults and incredibly Among generous you. people. Yeah. Yeah. Generous. You know, they, they, Anna and Jerry and Mark and Bobby were yeah. still one of the greatest uh, chunks. I've said this to you uh, before. But one of the greatest experiences I've had seeing something uh, played was when uh, Bobby and Howard De Silva did that extraordinary scene of What's Wrong with This Picture at, uh, at New Dramas. That's right. It just it's was jaw-dropping. It was electric. It yeah. was fantastic. And was the play... Had you written the entire it, the play, play at that point was under option mm -hmm. uh, 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 by Ronnie, Ronnie Lee. Lee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we option both of our plays. Yeah. And yeah. so new and new dramas. Would you talk a little bit about that? Well, maybe but, but, we, but, but, but that wasn't part of the new dramas project. No, they simply we, uh, lent us the space. I was I oh. was a member then, or or a wannabe. I think they well, rejected we, me we, six times. Yeah, we yeah. both were but, rejected five or six yeah. times. Yeah, they ah. did reject me six times. Yeah. So and tenacity uh, again. Yeah, yeah. tenacity. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so let that be comfort to you out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. But yeah. you did. You you uh, persuaded them to loan you the space. For yeah, I think it might have been a bit of time. You know, it was because Ronnie was on the board. That may have been it. That's oh, what there it was. You go. Yeah. So you, I was again, not yet a member. You knew someone highly placed. I was not. I would. I would not be a member for maybe eight or ten years. Yeah. And, and we after, both kept. After what's wrong with this picture? Yeah. What's wrong with this picture became sort of a cult, failed play that a lot of people love, and to this day they go, oh, what's wrong with this picture? Yeah, well, it was killed on Broadway, and mm -hmm. it's... It, des it deserves a, uh, an appropriate new production to redefine it, just as... I, yes, just yes, as, just yes. As here, here. Just as I, I, I volunteer. It, it, it's, it's, it's just like <laughs> Lady from Dubuque the first time out got killed, and when it came back to the signature, people said, oh, but this is one of all these major plays. Well, yes. we'll see if I live as long as Edward. Yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, but but uh, yeah. but uh, anyway, to speak to the thing, we we had four adults, four four bona fide you know grown ups well, with major who, who also who showed helped. up every week yeah. and were generous and enthusiastic. And amazing. did they help you learn how to voice you know m people more mature than yourselves? Like was that a part of no well, hearing their the, voices certainly were contributed yeah. to the work. Mm -hmm. They would uh, cold read for us, and uh, I mean and it was, was never enormously. never did it become didactic because no. of mm -hmm. their experience. They mm -hmm. were incredibly generous people. Also, they were Anne, writing, but Anne was coming. Anne, you know, yeah. Anne got back into her playwriting. Uh, Anne, oh, Anne, wow. Anne was coming partially to get up the courage to write uh, to write plays, and she yep. wrote two plays that uh, one which became very successful. After play, after play yeah. became very successful. But but they you know they use the the block as much as we use their experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, Anna and Jerry gave me my first paying job as a writer. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, yes, thirty-five what was that? years ago. Uh, I they had a, a a program, sort of an infomercial kind of program, mm -hmm. on a little oh, fledgling yes. network called Home Box Office. I've seen <laughs> a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah. And they they put, they've been putting them up. They've been putting what? them up on the web. You can you can find the some oh. of the short, or they're doing them again, maybe. Who? Uh, the, uh, Jerry and Ann. There's sketches. And Ben was shooting the, these those little things that they do. The, those infomercial. Oh. I think Ben was shooting them. Well, well anyway, but, but you can find them. They serve coming attractions. Of it was it was coming. called HBO sneak preview, and Ann and Jerry would say, you know, mm, next mm. month on HBO, John Travolta. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Hmm. And uh, and I, they needed a writer. They liked me. They liked my work. Mm -hmm. uh, I, um, I at the time I was working as a graphic designer. I was doing fine as a graphic designer, but I was. A playwright in training, mm -hmm. and uh, they uh, set me up for an audition. I wrote a spec script for mm -hmm. the producer at HBO, and I got hired. 
they needed a writer who was not a member of the Writers Guild. Well, I was nowhere near being a member of the Writers Guild at that time. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it led to a paying job that enabled me to quit my day job as a, as wow. a graphic designer. So that was 35 years. I owe that to Anna Jerry. Incredible. It, 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 was a, it was a remarkable group of people and mm -hmm. the fact that we stayed together for 10 years and so much that came out of that is now a lot of that's in the canon. It's, it, it, a lot of generally produced plays, a lot of those. But there was... So make, make your own... Make your own... Right. Yeah, I have make to agree with that, with we'll make your own opportunities. I mean, I think that's the nature of theater as an art. It's an art as well as a right. career. And right. if you get too focused on the careerism of it, you can, you're going to lose heart very well, quickly. So. Find communities that yep. will support you and that will be in the trenches with My you. My experience is very similar. I mean, I founded a small theater Voice and Vision, which developed the work of women writers and directors, and that's, you know, I would work with Lynn Nottage and uh, Kia Korthman, a lot and of... And this was, you, you know, had just, you just finished at Yale, yes? It you was, were like, I'm I started it before I graduated, mm -hmm. um, basically because I looked out there and there weren't very many women directing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I didn't think there was going to be a lot of opportunities for me to direct, I wasn't sure, so... Mm -hmm. I just started something, I wanted more women playwrights to have their work developed, um, and it was wonderful. And our philosophy was similar to the Playwright Center in the sense that it was whatever the playwright wanted for a process. Mm -hmm. We had a two week retreat at Bard College in the summers. And if they wanted to just write, they could just write. If they wanted some actors and they wanted to play with those actors, if they mm -hmm. needed some tech elements, we tried to provide them within the resources that we had. Um, and from that, I also learned, as you said, that every playwright works very differently. Some people really need those elements, and other people absolutely don't want to yeah. have them. And some people come in very finished, mm -hmm. polished with their play, mm -hmm. really just want to hear it, mm -hmm. um, don't want to make a lot of changes. Other people, if, you know, it's a different play by week two. And some people really feed off the audience, and other people really didn't want audience. Mm -hmm. And I thought one of the things that was really beneficial about it was having the option to not have audience mm -hmm. and having the option to, you know, I'd like a few people to come in and give me feedback, mm -hmm. but I don't want a big audience yet, mm -hmm. or I want, you know, a, quite, a, quite a bit of audience, then we would open it up more to the community and have mm -hmm. more people come mm -hmm. in. So. And one thing we try to do here that I think is really important is when we do, when the, when we do open it up to the public to hear the play read or to respond to the play, um, when we do the post-play discussions, I, I think it very much should rest in the hands of the writer what they want to hear, what they yeah. want to talk yeah. about. Yes. I, I've been to uh, several things of that ilk where um, the writer was not in control of yeah. the yes. Yes. Uh, talk, yeah. and, and there are things that you don't really no. need to hear from other people. Well, and you're, on, you're about something else, or you're, yeah. you I know mean, what that's you how, need. That's, that's how I conduct my classroom, mm -hmm. is that when the, student, when the presenting student has presented her work at, mm -hmm they, that student, presents the first question mm -hmm. to at least give us some direction to take this in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, now, I mean, now they, you know, they're so well trained that when, you know, someone presents the work, I just go, mm -hmm. and yes. they say, well, you know, I'm really having trouble with da 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 right. Did that come clear? Did, what did, you know, so instead of people saying, you know, I, you know I just didn't really like that, you know, which okay. I've seen that too. Oh, yeah, oh yeah. yeah. And that's really not helpful. And, and then, and then you yeah. get because audiences, you mem members that yeah. recommending plot twists from what they yeah. saw on right. last night's right. CSI right. 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 or something like right. that, which is, uh, is not useful. Yeah, because you know yeah. what you're about. It's yeah. that, it's that well, thing. Well, you, you can at least ask, ask the question of, excuse me, did you understand that she is his niece? No? Oh, okay, I've got to change yeah. that. Right. 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 I, I see that we are creeping up on 10.50 and you have to be someplace up and not you're going to go 11 you're going to teach a master class what time is that happening? do you have any are there any questions out here in the in the ether audience? but i think in you've got ether. to be someplace else entirely in 10 minutes this is true is it 10 minutes yeah oh yes yeah, that's all right yeah. my ride is here your ride is here judy's going to take you so, uh, so, uh, for you to you're going to teach a so master elvis class. is going to leave the do building. you have a question a quick question <laughs> okay we're good i was just kind of uh, curious uh, what your writing process was on dinner with friends I went through the trauma of seeing many couples in my life uh, break up. That was the process. And um, it, uh, you know, it's, it's I, I pretty much knew what it needed to be. You know, what I go through in my process is not having a clue 
what I'm doing and just sort of writing, hoping that the play will announce itself to me. And then other times I know what to do. <laughs> Dinner with Friends, I knew what to do. And once I figured on the structure of Dinner with Friends, structure is very important to me. I need some sort of armature on which to hang a play. Uh, with Dinner with Friends, I knew that the first act would be a triptych of scenes. I knew the second act would be a triptych of scenes. And then I realized that the way I had constructed it, I didn't allow for a scene in which all four characters appeared. Mm. And at one point I thought, maybe this is a three-act play. But no, it wasn't, I didn't need three acts. I needed another scene in the middle of those two triptychs mm. that showed us the four of them in happier times. Otherwise, I think without that scene, there would be no emotional resonance mm -hmm. because we wouldn't know what was lost. Mm -hmm. um, that was a crucial discovery. And, um, but it's part of the fun of doing this. <clears throat> well, I, wa I want to thank uh, Thank you. I want to thank, thank everybody. You. Mm -hmm. Thank you thank for you. joining us. Um, you. We're streaming live at 2 o'clock and at 3.30 Central Time. Uh, Ralph Voss, Inge's biographer, will be talking at 2 o'clock Central Time within the Inge collection showing Inge's archive. And at 3.30, uh, we're doing a panel about joining the digital age. So please join us on HowlRound. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yay. 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 I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm staying here, I guess. Oh, oh, okay. Marvelous. Yeah. 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 It's very exciting. Yeah. 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 I'm excited about. Um, uh, we were oh, Jenny. I think I mentioned I'm doing yes. Jenny Davis's play. Now